So I'm Tom Coughlin. I'm Jim Handy. And uh, we're going to talk to you about the long and winding road in persistent memories. So this is our sort of click and clack or Mutt and Jeff or Tom yes. and Jerry. Yep. Anyway. Big button. Yes, the big button. So uh, we'll be talking to you a bit about uh, persistent memory types. What are some of the memories that, that we're talking about here? Drivers in the market that are, uh, in, you heard some things. Uh, Dave Eggleston spoke in his keynote about this. We'll be talking about that as well some of the support requirements, and then finally an out, uh, some outlook from a report that uh, Jim and I uh, just finished recently. So first, let's look at persistent memory types. And the ones we're going to look at in particular are a phase change memory. Um, despite what Intel says, we still think a cross point probably falls into that category. Uh, magnetic random access memory, resistive RAM, ferroelectric uh, random access memory, and then there are others as well. And we'll touch, a lot of those are, are gonna be similar to the ones that uh, David mentioned, but we, we threw one out in there that, we, that he's not, he had, didn't get into. So 3D cross point, or you know, other types of phase change memory has actually been around a long time. Uh, this is a uh, electronics uh, magazine article from September 28th, 1970, uh, talking about Oshivsky's um, phase change memory technology phase change memory technology. So first amorphous semiconductor memory down there. So a lot of these things, and actually this is kind of an interesting thing in terms of history. Sometimes things take a long time before they, uh, they actually reach a point where they can be, uh, if they will ever reach a point, to reach the point where they, uh, they will be, become um, a viable entity and something that people can try to, uh, uh, can try to commercialize. And the, part of the reason is because of of the development of technology, the other is the demand for what they can, they can provide. So, uh, and this is actually one of Jim's slides, but it's a way of, another way of looking at kind of a hierarchy, hierarchy of different types of, of technologies for memory and storage. In this case, we've got a log-log scale for the price, uh, price per gigabyte of, uh, the store, of the different technologies, so we've got the, the caches in, in uh, processor L1, L2, L3, uh, plotted versus price per gigabyte, and then the bandwidth, the data rates, effective data rates you can get out of these technologies. So these are very fast, but they're rather expensive. And the faster they are, in general, the more expensive these technologies are. Then we have DRAM here, down here in, in the middle. Um, and then uh, solid state drives, hard disk drives, and tape down there. So tape or hard disk drives are less expensive, but they also, in general, provide lower data rates to access the information. So uh, there's the point here in this particular slide is that uh, there's some space between DRAM and SSD where some kind of pers persistent memory may be able to be added uh, as a way of augmenting these other technologies when used in combination with them. And so in this case, uh, we're showing that being a place where 3D cross point would fit in. And that's kind of the way that, it, another way of looking at what Intel was saying, uh, where they think their 3D cross point technology fits in. So what is a cross point? Well, a cross point is basically a memory structure where I've got what are called word lines and bit lines, and where they intersect is where, either with a voltage or a current, I can access a particular memory cell. So the memory cell is uh, the material in between here. So we have, uh, a, in this case, uh, we have a current that's going down here, and that's the green line uh, that's actually, uh, in this case, uh, supposed to be reading that cell, getting the information out of it. And then we also have the possibility of some of, that, uh, of some of that current actually leaking out. That's the red line here, giving you what's called sneak paths. And so the material that makes up this structure here has both a memory element and then oftentimes uh, a selector, a selector technology, something that basically tries to prevent these currents from uh, causing problems or erroneous data in, in adjacent cells. And uh, cross points can be stacked. This actually is that Intel Micron 3D cross point memory. So they've got basically uh, two levels of these uh, cross point memories on top of each other. So there's a certain amount of three dimensionality that they've implemented. Now, phase change memory in general, um, you have a, a uh, the classical one is the calcogenide materials, which would exist in both polycrystalline form as well as an amorphous form. And, uh, the, the, uh, and what you do is you, you uh, so here we are, you have a metal interconnect, we have the polycrystalline calcogenide 
uh, you apply some heat to that and you create a bubble of an amorphous material uh, which has a different resistivity than the crystalline material. So by having those two different resistive states, we're creating effectively a memory device. And uh, the way that works basically is if we do, uh, uh, oops, there, that's nah, not working. So if we, uh, we apply a higher temperature over a short period of time, we can create an amorphous region. Okay, so that's basically setting the memory and making it and, and making uh, uh, the, memory, uh, the, the memory state. Uh, if we were to go at a lower temperature, but we apply the uh, uh, apply uh, the apply that uh, temperature over a longer period of time, you give time for the amorphous material to crystallize, and basically that's a way to reset the material. So we've got these two different states and ways of accessing them. Um, they differ between one technology and another and how we do this, but with the phase change memory, that's what that's what's going on. The interesting thing about this is the current only goes in one direction. So uh, the kind of phase change memory that have existed have uh, it are, we've already seen products in the past are these NOR compatible uh, phase change memories. Both Samsung and Mnemonics, uh, now part of Micron, uh, were using, shipping some of these products in the past. They both obsoleted at this point. These materials, you know, people have been working on this since the late 60s, early 70s, so it's a pretty well understood material that chalcogenides are. Um, there's a single current flow direction, um, so this is a, uh, a unipolar technology. We don't have to change the direction of the current flow uh, to be able to access the information or to write information. Uh, the selector device is not very complicated as a consequence of that. Um, Today, there's not really commercial products uh, too large, too, very much out there. It's largely experimental and university products uh, in this classical uh, phase change memory technology. And this one is Jim's. Yes. Go ahead, Jim. Indeed. <laughs> so so um, Intel is, is uh, producing 3D crosspoint memory based on this phase change. And um, something that I think is very telling about this is that you know a couple of years ago, three years ago actually, when they first introduced it, at the Flash Memory Summit a month later, I said Intel's probably going to have two years of losses by uh, producing phase change memory. Now uh, this is the profitability. The this is the uh, um, net profit margin of companies who make NAND flash. This doesn't, isn't exclusively their NAND flash profits because those numbers don't exist. So some of this is polluted a little bit by DRAM profits. Um, and uh, there's another thing that factors in there and that is that Intel tooled up a new NAND flash plant in Dalian, China, which also impacts their profitability. But um, you, you look and you know, they, they basically lost a lot of money over the- Oops, Jim, Jim. <laughs> oh, Stephen Bates had this problem on Monday. Oh, now, hate it when that some happens. Really choice words for it, you know. And yeah. uh, I don't know if you guys remember what the words are, but the word <laughs> that he used was abracadabra. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to learn that word. Okay. So anyway, all I was saying was that. That, that Intel is losing money. Some of this is from Dalian, some of it is from 3D Crosspoint, but still, one of the things that I'm gonna be stressing later in the presentation is that you have to make a whole lot of something to be able to get uh, profitability out of it, and 3D Crosspoint isn't there yet. So, uh, you know, we have a report that we put out on the 3D Crosspoint memory a while ago uh, that is now available. <laughs> and it talks about 3D crosspoint, why, how, when it's going to happen. <clears throat> and, and the reason Tom and I are up here is that we sell reports for a living. Yep. So, so yep. if you want to know anything about 3D crosspoint, then you know, go to the Objective Analysis website, have a look at it. But now I'm going to hand it back over to Tom so that he can take you through the next few slides. Thank you, Jim. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more about some of these technologies. The next one is magnetic random access memory. And so this is basically using magnetic materials in order to, uh, in order to be able to store, inf store information as a non-volatile memory. Um, so the first type of, uh, of M or the MRAM that's been the most popular or the most used up to date, especially by a company called Everspin, which you heard about before in Dave's talk, is called a toggle MRAM. It's basically an offshoot of the hard disk drive uh, read head transducer design where you have 
um, in-plane magnetic materials, and a, uh, uh, these are uh, actually metallic, metallic magnetic materials, and you've got an insulating layer. The insulating layer is very thin, and as a consequence, uh, the, uh, I can, uh, uh, I've got, I can get tunneling, uh, I get uh, tunneling electrons that can go through this. And uh, in the case that the two, and one of the magnetic layers is actually fixed in its magnetic orientation, oftentimes by an antiferromagnetic anti material that is adjacent to it. The other one is free to rotate. If both of those layers are oriented in the same direction, then that's a low resistance state. It's easy for those electrons to cross the tunneling barrier and move from one, from one of the layers to the other. Um, in the case where, we're, so this is uh, basically your, your reset or your um, default state. This is a, and in the case where they're actually in, in opposite orientations, that becomes a high resistance state. And then it's more difficult for the electrons to be able to tunnel from the one layer to the other layer. So this is called a magnetic tunnel junction, uh, where I have the magnetic material insulator and then another magnetic material. And the magnetic properties determine the, resist the bar tunnel barrier resistance as well as the thickness of the material. Um, this is a technology that has had the most volume of uh, magnetic RAM being made, but it has issues compared to the more uh, recent technologies such as spin tunnel torque or STT uh, MRAM. And that's the next one we'll talk about here. So in the case of spin tunnel torque MRAM, it actually deals with some of the scaling issues that we ran into with this uh, in-plane uh, toggle mode uh, MRAM. Uh, and particularly if you go, instead of in the plane orientation of the magnetic materials, you go to a perpendicular orientation. So it's actually a magnetic orientation out of the plane. And that's what the modern uh, spin, tunnel, uh, spin tunnel torque uh, magnetic tunnel junctions do. So again, if the, if the two uh, magnetic layers are in the same orientation, I'm in a low resistance state. It's easy for the electrons to tunnel again through this oxide uh, tunnel barrier here. In the case of uh, where they're anti-parallel to each other, they're going in different orientations. Now it's a, uh, you have a, a more difficult time for the electrons to be able to tunnel through, and as a result, the resistance is higher. So MRAM effectively is, a, is, is a, one type of a resistive memory device, only it's using magnetics in order to change the resist, resistive state and therefore be able to store information. So um, this is the technology that, uh, that is being uh, also uh, so uh, Everspin is going to be making standalone uh, chips with this technology. It's been working. They've actually uh, shipped some parts. They're in that. Uh, they're actually being used in that uh, IBM uh, drive that uh, Dave Eggleston talked about during the keynote. But they're also. This is the technology that's being uh, talked about for all the folks that are talking about doing embedded MRAM. They're going to do the spin tunnel torque perpendicular orientation MRAM. So the status uh, was once considered a DRAM replacement. The, the big issue there is getting the price down to where it is truly competitive, and that requires getting the volumes up to, getting the volumes up in manufacturing that they can uh, that they could do that. And so we're quite a ways away from that. There's a possibility, and actually in our report towards the end of our projection period, a chance that if volumes get up, that we could do that. But uh, um, it's uh, right now it's it's it probably is going to be threatening more uh, NOR, and also uh, uh, SRAM for different reasons. So there's only one chip supplier for the, for the um, standalone parts at this point, Everspin. They have shipped over 70 million units. A lot of these are very small capacity devices that are used for caching and buffering. But they're very fast and they're persistent and they don't wear out. And so that's why they're popular for these applications. Uh, they've they've, they're in the process of converting from uh, this toggle, uh, toggle uh, MRAM to spin tunnel torque MRAM. And they developed a partnership with Global Foundries to make 300 millimeter wafers both for Everspin's own production, but also as a process that could be used for embedded memory uh, with MRAM in it. So they have a whole line of products with, with uh, embedded MRAM. And by the way, also, because I was at uh, the, their uh, 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 Global Foundries technology meeting yesterday, they also apparently have a resistive RAM option, not magnetic, uh, for an embedded memory as well. Um, others are uh, basically said that they're doing things in this either in terms of uh, providing IP or natural production. That a lot of the major, it seems like most of the major foundries are talking about having embedded MRAM options that people could use in their embedded products. So uh, TSMC, UMC, for example, and Samsung. Uh, also, there's people with IP like Avalanche and Spin Transfer and TDK and Toshiba have also made some mention of, of the, using these technologies. Today's markets are 
special environments right now for the standalone products, okay, uh, like space or uh, high uptime systems or caching and buffering applications. But potentially, if this becomes part of a, an embedded process, the volume could go up, okay? That would bring down the total price of, of putting the MRAM in, in a products, and that could lead to even more applications potentially becoming one of these uh, major, uh, major elements in the, in the, the new non-volatile memories for persistent memory applications. So let's talk now about ferroelectric memory. So <laughs> ferroelectric memory basically is causing uh, some materials, they act kind of like magnets do, only with, uh, with, with electricity, with static electricity. They'll create a spontaneous uh, um, charge polarization inside the material. We call those ferroelectric materials. And they actually have hysteresis loops if you run them through applied fields that are similar to those you get with magnetic materials. So it's, it's kind of an analogy uh, to these magnetic materials. So there's a long history of products being made with, with ferroelectric memories. And actually, our commercial products are very specialized applications that have been available for a long time. Uh, Ramtron, now Cyprus, uh, is, talk, uh, is, talk about, is partnered with Fujitsu with the idea of some higher volume applications. Uh, PZT, which is lead zirconium titanate, is the, the conventional product that people have used for a long time for these materials. Um, there are uh, versions of this which actually are kind of interesting because they have flexible, thin film, organic ferroelectric uh, memory devices are out there, you know, with limited capacity, but you can put it on a flexible substrate. Could be interesting for some applications. Um, another company called Symmetrix. Hafnium oxide is a material that's actually used in a lot, of, a lot of CMOS semiconductor processing. It turns out that there is a form of hafnium oxide that actually can be quite ferroelectric. Um, and that, that uh, showed up in the industry in the last few years. Uh, there's a company in Dresden, Germany, um, that is uh, trying to develop uh, 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 ferroelectric RAM products using hafnium oxide for that. Uh, today's markets, RFID, other low right current applications, uh, the a flexible ferroelectric uh, uh, RAM device might be used for um, wearable devices, things of that sort. They may have to uh, you know, undergo a lot of flexing or, or where the flexibility is, is a value. And then the general topic of resistive RAM, which is a, a big field. As I mentioned before, in a sense, you could say that uh, the magnetic random access memory is a, is, is a resistive memory. It causes resistive memory state. Anything that changes a resistance in the device that I can get two separate states, um, it falls into this category. In fact, phase change memory uh, is one of those, as I said, uh, MRAM essentially. Um, some of the more famous ones are the Memristor that HP was working on and announced a few years ago. Uh, there's also the oxygen vacancy uh, products and, uh, uh, and also CV RAM. And then another one we're going to talk about, which fits into this general category, is carbon nanotubes. Okay, so let's look at some of these each in turn. Um, so resistive RAM. It's any memory, again, with a resistive bit. In other words, a change in resistance will give you a one or a zero, okay? And it, it's sort of a generic picture. I have a top electrode, a bottom electrode, and then I've got my switching media. And then I have something that's happening in the switching media that can cause it, the resistance to either be higher or lower. Maybe it's movement of ions. Maybe it's uh, oxygen vacancy movements. Maybe it's uh, filaments forming. Various sorts of things can do that. And so the, the issue with a number of these, these processes is that it's a bipolar process. In other words, I'm going to drive current uh, in both directions through the memory device to do different things. Okay? In this case, for instance, I've got an initial state over here. So this is a, a high resistance state. Whatever the bubbly conductive things are there, they're not, they're, uh, they're not going all the way from the top electrode to the bottom electrode. So the resistance is fairly high. Now, I apply a current or, or, uh, there in that set mode on the left, and then I can end up dispersing some of those conductive uh, things uh, in between the top electrode and the bottom electrode. Now, my res now I have a, a better conductive path between those two electrodes. I'm in a low resistive state. Now, if I want to, uh, uh, so, that's the, so I can read that, okay? And then if I want to then erase it and go back to where I was, then I have to apply current in the other direction. Now I'm driving those little conductive bubbles um, and forcing them back up to the top electrode from the bottom electrode. So a simplified view of what's going on here. And now 
I'm back to a high resistive state. So I have a low resistance state to a high resistive state, but to go from one to the other, I have to apply current in one direction and then in the other direction. So it's a bipolar device versus, for instance, the phase change memory, which only required current to go in one direction. Um, so here's the uh, oxygen vacancy, it's, or oxygen depletion memory. Um, to some extent, the mechanisms are, are varied or not well understood depending upon the technology. A uh, company, uh, Pioneer, or Unity pioneered uh, this technology. They were acquired by Rambus, and consequently it was shut down. Um, there's a lot of research underway at universities and memory makers on trying to make this into a reality. So this thing has possibilities, and it's one of the, uh, one of the big um, uh, resistive RAM technologies that's uh, being talked about. Uh, the Memristor is the thing that, that uh, HP did a few years ago. Uh, they said it was a missing circuit element. Okay, talking about a paper that was done, I think, in the 1970s, uh, talking about there being various sorts of uh, basic circuit elements and something that had the properties like this Memristor uh, showed uh, was, was a missing circuit element. So HP is the only one that uh, basically made this, although they did, I think, was SK Hynix that they were uh, at one time uh, talking about manufacturing, but I don't think anything ever came of it. Um, a lot of people claim it's really just one of these oxygen vacancy devices. Uh, and it was uh, supposed to be the basis of the persistent memory in HP's the machine. Um, I hope there's not anyone from HP here, I don't want to insult them. But it did end up delaying that project. Uh, when they finally did it, it was mostly with, uh, with solid state drives, or rather flash memory that they were using a couple years ago. So, um, so it's, the future is unclear at this point of this Memristor technology, but it's kind of famous because of the, uh, uh, they made a lot of publicity about it at the time. So here's a conductive bridge uh, 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 resistive RAM devices. So uh, it may, for instance, be silver filaments and glass. Adesto is currently shipping a limited volume of products like that. Other companies are trying to get in there. Contour was acquired by Western Digital. Uh, Crossbar is licensed to, several, to multiple foundries. Um, and this, this actually is, is Crossbar is that company earlier that Dave was mentioning is also doing some work on neural network. Uh, type technology using resistive memory devices. So it's basically uh, one of these uh, uh, conductive bridge devices here. Today's markets, for instance, high radiation, medical, and space applications. So specialized, a lot of these memories, as you can see, are used in very specialized niche markets. Okay, they, in order to get to the higher volume, get the cost down, they have to become more general markets. Now, carbon nanotubes. With carbon nanotubes and buckyballs and all these things are really wonderful, wonderful things. Um, they've been of, of great scientific interest and technological interest for a long time, um, including the idea of using these as memory devices. So there's a company called Nantero um, that has been around for a while, actually has a lot of, worked with a lot of companies, provided licenses and stuff. The most recent one was a partnership with Fujitsu with the idea of making these in a higher volume. And time will tell, we'll have to see it. I think uh, Gervaisi spoke, uh, earlier at the conference. Um, there also is a lot of university research on this. Um, it holds a promise of uh, potentially making very small, um, lithographically small, well, manufactured small devices that could provide a, 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 a potentially dense memories. So all of, sorry? This is mine. This one is yours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. All, all of these memories have something in common with each other. They're all a single element cell. Um, so they end up being able to be scaled very small as opposed to something like an SRAM or an E squared PROM, which uses multiple elements. Um, some of them use a diode select mechanism. Um, MRAM uses a transistor to select, which automatically makes it larger. If you can use a diode to select, then that allows you to use that cross point architecture and be able to stack cells. And so because of the fact that they uh, can scale so small, then there's a possibility that the number of transistors on a chip can scale past DRAM and NAND flash. And if that can happen, then the costs can scale beyond DRAM and NAND flash. So this is, this is why the technology is uh, so interesting to these people. In fact, wasn't there a paper just uh, we saw yesterday? A uh, nature paper, I think, that was talking about some folks from Stanford. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there, was, there was a nature paper about MRAM that mm -hmm. said that, that uh, some people at Stanford had found a way to uh, get past using the transistor mm -hmm. for the select device inside an MRAM. Mm -hmm. And I haven't read the paper. I just saw something in storage newsletter about it. Um, yep. So, you know, I look forward to learning more about that. Um, 
All of these technologies are non-volatile. One of the reasons why people put up with DRAM and SRAM is because of the fact that they're fast. But if they could be persistent, that would be so much better. And so non-volatile is the memory chip guy, which I am. Memory chip guy's way of saying persistent. Um, they're also right in place. They don't have this really messy block erase and uh, you know page write. Um, and they have read and write speeds that are more similar to each other. They're not off by a couple of orders of magnitude like in hand flash. They're, they're more in line with each other. And so because of that, they're all very um, attractive. The thing that gets in the way of their just moving in and taking over is that they use new materials, which I apologize to the people in the back who can't see the bottom bullet on that, but it just says new materials. Um, anything that, that uh, uses a new material is something that is difficult to get past um, in manufacturing. And I'll go into that a little bit more when I get into the economics part of this presentation. Um, and so this is, this is like uh, an eye chart. <laughs> it's something that is for your future reference when you pull the slides off the website, but it compares the technologies against each other and against established technologies, SRAM, DRAM, nor Flash, but then there are some other technologies here. And it's just a whole number of different uh, it, uh, attributes that each one has. Um, you know, wear is an important one for some of these, power and read speed, write speed. But uh, you know, an easier oh, way to yeah. look at this is um, if you just take probably the most important criteria here. And so you've got um, on the back, once again, on the bottom for the people in the back, it says cell size in F squared. That's the way that chip people measure what the cell size is. And so you get over toward me, it's a larger cell size. You get over toward the other end of the room, it's a smaller cell size. And then the thing that's important to most of you is the bandwidth. How fast is it? And so SRAM is way up there as far as the speed goes. And oops, and oops, oops, the PowerPoint gods hit us. Oh, this is Scott Shadley's uh, haunted slide. That kept That's right. His show. And it showed up in our show. Scott Shadley's presentation. <laughs> well, he didn't know the word either, but abracadabra. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if these guys knew the word, their presentations would have gone so much more smooth. It's so much easier when you know yeah. it. Okay, so, so anyway, you've got the, the more expensive things are over toward here. MTJM RAM, which is the old kind of MRAM, is way over on my side of the chart. SRAM is way over on my side. Those are expensive technologies. You go toward the center of the chart and you have STTM RAM, you know, that's as cheap as a DRAM. A DRAM is there too. These, these are just approximate locations because STTM RAM and DRAM should be about the same cell size there, but then you couldn't read them. Um, NRAM, the Nantero NRAM should be uh, towards the center there too. As far as I understand, and Bill correct me if I'm wrong, that's a single transistor technology right now, isn't it? Zero transistor, okay, so take that pink thing in the middle and push it over to PCM <laughs> and, and flash, because that's the cheap end of things. And NRAM has the advantage that it's faster than NAND flash, PCM has that advantage too, and that's why Intel is pushing it into 3D cross point. So I'll hand it back over to Tom. Indeed. All right, so now it's time for a brief commercial announcement. So this is the, re this is the report that Jim and I uh, just finished very recently where we're looking into uh, persistent memory ecosystem. We're talking about all the different types of uh, memories in some detail, um, talk about how they're used, the company's making them, um, and then talk about support requirements and what could make these memories become more mainstream, what's the requirements to do that. And then we give forecasts based upon uh, persistent memory consumption uh, for both discrete and embedded products. So it's a 161 page report with 31 tables and 111 figures, and it is now available. So with that commercial announcement, you go back to your regular program. <laughs> Tom called that his pop-up slide. Yes. So now I'm gonna talk about markets. Even though I'm an engineer, I talk about markets. So uh, market drivers for these things, um, you know, we've got, Persistent memory competing against RAM. You've got persistent memory and SOCs. Those are two very different markets. Uh, persistent memory and SOCs is, is going in there for a different reason than persistent memory versus RAM. And then I'm going to talk about the economies of scale. And that's an important thing, the reason why Intel is losing money. So this is the vision for, and, and I'm out of jokes, so I'm not gonna have something pop up over this. <laughs> but, but this is the vision that everybody has had for a very long time 
for how these new memory technologies are going to fit in. The bottom axis, once again for those of you in the back, is process geometries. It starts with the largest process geometries on that side, it moves to the smaller process geometries on this side. It's kind of like saying time. Um, and then you've got a logarithm of the price per gigabyte on the vertical axis. And this is close to the truth, but you know, it's, it's just straight lines on a chart. Um, the assumption here is that the new technology, a wafer of the new technology, costs twice as much to make as a wafer of the uh, established entrenched technology, I like to say, which is flash, the red line in here. And so um, you've got flash always being cheaper at each process geometry than the new technology until some point at which flash stops scaling. Now that was 15 nanometers for NAND flash and for NOR flash it's 15 nanometers too. Everybody saw this coming and so I actually put this slide together in I think 2007 um, and it just said how are things likely to go given what we knew back then and we were expecting around 15 nanometers, I think it was 8 nanometers for this particular slide. Then flash would stop scaling. If it stops scaling, the price stops going down. And so that's why the red line goes flat there. And that's the opportunity that a lot of these new technologies have been looking for is, uh, you know, once scaling stops, then they'll have the opportunity to reach a lower price point than the established technology, even though the wafer might cost more to produce. And eventually, with economies of scale and everything like that, then that black line would come down and it would be cheaper to produce. But you know, this was, this was the thing that was driving the market. What ended up happening in actuality was in 2006 uh, or 2007, Toshiba came out with 3D NAND and that gave new life to NAND flash. But that hasn't done a thing for the NOR flash and SOCs. And so SOCs still are a ripe place for, um, for new memory technologies to get in. Um, so I like to uh, point out that there are only three elements to uh, memory costs. The cost per gigabyte depends on the cost of the wafer, like I said in the last slide. How many megabytes you can get onto the wafer, which is tied into the process geometry that you're doing and also how small your cell is. And then what is your yield? Are 50% of the chips that you make on a wafer useful? or 99%, and everybody in the industry pushes to get way up there near 99%. Um, and then the megabytes per wafer are driven by the size of the bit, which was that thing that was on that chart with the bubbles on it that I have to correct for NROM. Um, and you know maybe for STT sometime too. But, but the megabits per wafer is driven by the size of the bits, um, shrinking the process down to you know 90 nanometers, 50 nanometers, whatever. Um, allows you to do cost reductions, and so manufacturers shrink the process to drive the costs down. That's how Moore's Law works. But the important thing is, is that wafer cost and yield are functions of the amount of volume that you push through the wafer fab. And so that's the economies of scale, is how many of these things do you make? Um, this is an example, a very concrete example, of pricing of NAND flash and DRAM. Um, NAND flash is the black line, DRAM is the red line, and I have a dotted line at the beginning of the black line because this was before the source that I used, the World Semiconductor Trade Statistics, WSTS. It was before they actually uh, provided price per gigabyte of NAND flash. But you can see that there was a crossover there. Um, what's interesting is that NAND flash is inherently a smaller die size than DRAM and yet its price was higher because the economies of scale weren't there. The, the industry wasn't making enough NAND flash. The beauty of this is that in 2004, the crossover set the stage for putting SSDs into uh, computers. Mm -hmm. Before that time, hard drives were a cheaper way of adding storage to computers and DRAM was a cheaper way of adding speed. Now, SSDs are a cheaper way of adding speed than DRAM. Um, in a lot of cases, people get by with a very minimum amount of DRAM in order to take advantage of that. And this scale shows up in this chart, which is driven off the same statistics. This is how many gigabytes shipped of each of these technologies, NAND flash on the black line and DRAM on the red line. And so you can see that there was a crossover. What's important, oh, I didn't, I thought I had a, a build on there, but what's important is that in 2004, when the dotted line turns into the uh, um, solid black line, NAND flash gigabyte shipments were within an order of magnitude of DRAM unit shipments. 
And so what that means is that as long as your bit shipments are less than an order of magnitude of whatever it is you're trying to displace, chances are you're not going to be able to reach the scale to get your costs down. The same is true of all memory technologies. You can't get um, a competitive price unless you've got good scale. So this is a very busy chart to explain how that all works together and how these different technologies work against each other. For the people in the back of the room, the chart goes from 2010 out to 2030. That's because for Tom's and my report, that's uh, the, the time range that we looked at. We took a very wide time range to do our forecasting because we think that some of these changes are gonna be relatively slow. You've got all of these technologies that already exist and then a red line for the new memory and how we expect it to work as its scale grows and as it takes advantage of the fact that it's got a smaller process geometry than, or a smaller cell size than these mm -hmm. other technologies. So E squared prom is the most expensive cost per gigabyte, but it doesn't matter because it's just in little five cent parts, two cent parts that are used for the serial presence detect in uh, DIMMs or for uh, storing the, um, uh, password, I'm sorry, passwords, identity numbers in, in internet connected devices and that kind of thing. SRAM is also very expensive. It's got six transistors in each bit cell and NOR flash is also a very expensive technology. DRAM has, is, you know, a far less expensive technology, but we're expecting for it to do what that curve I showed you before mm -hmm. is doing is, is that it's starting to hit a scaling limit and its prices are probably going to level off. And then finally, NAND flash down at the bottom, which we expect to go for a while. <laughs> We're expecting to see the interplay between these things. Oh, sorry about that. These, these technologies um, are, their markets in revenue dollars are shrinking. And so because of that, nobody's spending money to move them to the next process technology node. So they're going to just stay where they are price-wise. Um, NAND flash and DRAM. And I apologize to the people in the back who can't read this word balloon, but it just says process leaders, DRAM and NAND, cost reduced to Moore's Law. Those, those are the technologies that are still scaling. They're still being made using finer and finer process geometries. And then you've got your new memory. And what's happening with the new memory is the same thing that happened with NAND flash, is that it's moving from a lagging edge process, some very behind process, MRAM is right now at 40 nanometers, uh, moving there from 90 nanometers, Whereas you've got DRAM that's in the you know, uh, 18 nanometer to 15 nanometer area. You know, the new memories have some catching up to do, but they'll do that and so their prices will come down faster. And so as a result of that, we're expecting, we've already seen uh, MRAM in particular go past E, e, prom, uh, e squared prom prices. We're expecting uh, a price crossover with SRAM today. Um, there'll be a NOR crossover pretty soon mm -hmm. and then uh, we'll see DRAM stop scaling at some point. And in this slide, it's built in, I think, around 2024. And when that happens, then we'll end up having the new memory technology cross over DRAM a couple of process generations later, just like in that earlier slide. We don't expect to see NAND flash crossed over by a new technology anytime soon. So what are the support requirements for this? This is a place where SNEA really shines. Yeah, you need to have hardware support. So this is like new DIMMs and that kind of a thing. You need to have software support, operating system support, and uh, application program support. And uh, in the hardware for these new technologies is an early development. We've got NVDIM ends, which are a good proxy for what's going to happen when the NVDIM P comes in. The NVDIM ends are just DRAM with flash backup. But we've also seen some things that haven't really been noticeable, and that is like changes in the BIOS to recognize that persistent memory is there, and maybe you can boot up knowing that the memory has got valid data in it. And then new signals to the DIM to allow it to uh, understand a power failure in the case of an NVDIM N. And soon, 10 minutes, <laughs> soon, soon we'll have uh, you know, new, new uh, Optane modules that have some new signaling on them too. We don't know what those are, but you know, those, those of them sure have been worked out. Um, there is an NVDIM report. This is the last advertisement, I promise. <laughs> and, and I put that out about almost a year ago, but it does cover NVDIM Ns and NVDIM Ps and forecasts what all the technology is going to be for those. Um, but uh, there are ongoing hardware requirements to handle NUMA. 
um, you need to uh, be able to deal with uh, different speed memories and, and non-determinism. And basically, you hit um, an Optane DIM with enough writes in a row, and it's going to slow down. And so you're going to need to be able to feed that back to the processor somehow. That's a new, new support requirement. Some of this is going to require redesign of the MMU because you're no longer doing context switches when you find that what you need is not in there or that you need to evict something. Um, they're using polling right now uh, where the processor actually ties itself up reading, reading, reading what the status is of the DIM. And then finally, uh, when it gets what it needs, then it will come back out again. The reason it's doing that is because a, um, uh, a context switch is a very, very slow process in most processors. Um, and then finally, updates to the DDR bus to mm -hmm. support these non-deterministic access times. Um, this is SNEA's diagram for the programming model for persistent memory. And so um, I, I love it that they used to talk about the uh, squiggly, squiggly lines. lines yes. Yeah, <laughs> where the things were different. But basically, the most important takeaway from this is that the application has got to be able to talk directly to the PM device mm -hmm. or run through its normal um, storage stack to be able to do it. And so they've put together all of the tools to be able to do that. So then application programs can be developed to make that work. And I've got the URL for the persistent memory model there. Um, applications programs, um, you know, they, they uh, are really required for this, mm -hmm. that there really isn't any benefit to having persistent memory in your system unless you've got an applications program that's going to take advantage of that. And this change I'm expecting to take some time. Jim Pappas likes to talk about it taking two Olympic cycles. Um, so about eight years for it to become, go from, from new to becoming something that's in popular use. And then finally, you know, what is the forecast for this? <clears throat> well, you know, I say nothing works in a vacuum. It's not one thing that's got to work by itself. It's like the whole memory ecosystem and everything like that has to work together. So persistent memory is just a part of that ecosystem. And the memory market swings very wildly. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is 3D Crosspoint, for example, has to be cheaper than DRAM to make any sense in that uh, diagram that Tom showed you with the bubbles on it of the different levels of memory. And uh, so when the DRAM market falls apart, which it should be doing either late this year or early next year, and when prices go down by about 60%, then um, Optane memory is going to have to go down by 60% in price too. And that's going to be really tough for Intel if they're already losing money on this technology. Foundry processes though should have a huge impact because if these SOCs that I said were going to be using um, an emerging memory technology, if they start reaching high volumes, then s the silicon processing community is going to understand, they're going to learn how to use um, persistent memories and how to make them yield. And so that's going to then fall back into uh, the standalone memory chip market. And that's going to benefit those guys. Um, you know, I'm expecting for 3D NAND to continue to increase. This is a timeline out through 2022 of how many layers should be in 3D NAND. And it used to be that the industry thought that it was going to stop at about 100 layers. And then somebody, I don't know who, invented string stacking. And string stacking allows you to basically build a 64 layer NAND and then build another 64 layer NAND on top of it and mm -hmm. another 64 layer. And nobody knows how far this can be taken. There's talk about 500 layers today. I wouldn't be at all surprised if two years, in two years, there's gonna be talk about 1,000 or 2,000 layers. Um, and so that kind of allows NAND flash to avoid being superseded by these technologies. Another thing that's really important to this is that there are cycles in the memory business. And there's a very simplified way of looking at uh, how price cycles work. But basically, during a time like this, you remember that slide that I showed you that had everybody's profits and Intel's losses? Everybody's really profitable. So they're all investing like crazy, putting in uh, new fabs. Sometime that is all going to kick in, and that is going to cause an overcapacity. The overcapacity is gonna cause everybody to compete on price, and the prices then will collapse, and so the manufacturers will then stop investing, and eventually the market will catch up to however much processed uh, capacity they have, 
And once it catches up again, then uh, I expect it to see uh, the profits regained. Um, you know, that our, our overall look at that is a collapse in 2018 or early 2019 and a recovery, unfortunately, not until 2022 because of the emergence of China as an important supplier. So stable prices to the middle of 2018, driving profits, and then once 3D NAND becomes cost competitive, we're expecting to see planar NAND the capacity turned over to DRAM and caused that to unravel DRAM pricing. But China won't be a factor until the downturn. The 2018 price collapse, though, will be supply driven. It won't be because of a lack of demand. Everybody is just consuming all kinds of memory, but uh, not enough to catch up with, with what's going to happen in the industry. And we have today in DRAM the largest price cost gap that there ever has been in the market. The impact to persistent memory, like I said about 3D Crosspoint, persistent memory competes on price against these established technologies. So 3D Crosspoint must be cheaper than DRAM to make any sense. And a DRAM collapse will cause a 3D Crosspoint collapse, even though 3D Crosspoint is sole sourced. Because being sole sourced in this case doesn't mean that you've got everybody locked in. They're going to be able to say, okay, well, it was nice using 3D Crosspoint when it was cheap, but now that DRAM's cheaper, we'll just go back to using DRAM. So we're looking at a timeline for change. This, uh, what I have is logic on the top bar. That's the SOCs. That is the NOR flash inside of uh, your microcontrollers, your ASICs, and even inside processor chips where things like microcode are stored inside of there. We're not sure which technology is going to be used to displace those. Right now, the biggest contenders are resistive RAM and MRAM, but that could change very rapidly. Um, in NAND flash, we think that there's a possibility that it's going to be displaced by resistive RAM, but that just depends on whether or not NAND flash runs out of layers and needs to be replaced. SanDisk used to say that there were only going to be three generations of, of 3D NAND before that ran out of steam. Uh, now, you know, people are talking about these 500 layer devices. DRAM. Uh, you know, that's another question. You know, I'm, Bill, Bill is going to be talking to you later on. Uh, it's today you're talking, right? Yeah, and Entero is going to be uh, presenting their case as to why NROM should be a good technology to displace, or NRAM, I'm sorry, should be, yeah, yeah. NRAM should be yeah. a good technology to displace uh, DRAM, and, and it very well could. MRAM is something that a lot of people have been talking about in the past, but I put a question mark by that mm -hmm. because it's still not decided. But you know, this, the timeline goes out to 2035, an awful lot can happen in that amount of time. You guys have been in technology for a long time, so you know. And finally, getting off the hamster ball of supply and demand. <laughs> um, here's our projections for a, a, a high baseline and a low projection for, uh, for, a bit for these emerging memories uh, out to 2028 here. So um, and the bottom line here is that uh, our baseline case is the uh, emerging memory, non-volatile memory market could exceed about $6 billion by 2023. Um, and so that's, a, that's from our report there, and that's basically our presentation today. So thank you all very much for being a wonderful audience. Thank you.